Wolfenstein II The New Colossus may seem more like science fiction than history. It takes place in a fictional universe where Nazis took over the world, where the South United States is run by the Ku Klux Klan, where decapitated heads walk around on robotic bodies, and where Adolf Hitler lives on a secret military base on Venus. Nevertheless, in this video, I'm going to try to convince you that Wolfenstein is historical to its very core and deals with some of the most controversial historical questions that historians have been debating for the past 80 years. I'm Dr. Darren Reed, and you're watching History Through Games, Wolfenstein Edition. Thank you for tuning in! I'm a historian at McGill University, and this is a new video series I'm starting that will explore historical themes and debates through some of your favorite games, especially games that people don't think of as particularly historical. I really want this series to, to develop in collaboration with you, so please, if there's any games or historical themes or debates you're interested in, let me know in the comments below and I'll move your suggestions to the top of my future episode to-do list. I want to give a shout out to Leo, who gave me my first request. Uh, you requested a uh, series of videos about art history in the Legend of Zelda universe, which I'm totally excited to do. Uh, it takes me some time to do these videos, since I have a full-time job and a baby to take care of, but I just want to say I heard you and I have some videos in the works for you. I'm not here to tell you that the events in Wolfenstein II The New Colossus are historical. The game takes place in an alternate fictional universe, and nothing that happens did actually happen, and nothing can really be called history. However, it's the basic premise of an alternate historical timeline that is very historical about Wolfenstein II. Let me explain. The practice of writing alternative history stories is not as old as you may think. The first recorded alternate history story dates back to the early 19th century when French writers began contemplating what life would have been like if Napoleon had conquered Europe. This started a tradition of politicians and philosophers contemplating what life would have been like if certain important events had turned out differently. One of the most interesting stories was written by Sir Winston Churchill in the early 20th century where he wrote from the perspective of a fictional historian from a different timeline, pondering what the United States would have looked like if uh, General Lee had won the Battle of Gettysburg. But these stories were never really considered histories. They were imaginative literary endeavors. But this changed in the 1950s, when a group of historians calling themselves the New Economic Historians began using alternative history and alternative timelines in their serious academic research. Two of the first people to do this were Alfred Conrad and John Mayer, who were economic historians at Harvard in the 1950s. They wanted to investigate whether American slavery would have been abolished if the Civil War had never happened. They were testing the theory, which was popular at the time, that slavery was inherently unprofitable and would have collapsed by itself without the Civil War, which would have made the Civil War an uh, unnecessary and pointless waste of, of human lives. What they did was they used economic data to project the future of slavery in a world where the Civil War had never happened. And what they determined, what they argued, was that slavery, American slavery, was much more profitable than historians had ever believed. And they argued that American slavery would never have been abolished without the Civil War. Following in their footsteps six years later, another economic historian named Robert Fogel wrote a controversial book called Railroads and American Economic Growth, where he constructed an alternate universe where trains had never happened. He was trying to test the, uh, the commonly accepted theory that the American economy was dependent on the construction of extensive railway lines in the 19th century. And he did this by using economic data to think about what the world would have looked like in a world without trains. He determined that if America had never invested in its railway network, 
it would have likely invested in an extensive canal system that was equally as profitable as trains would have been, essentially disproving one of the most fundamentally accepted aspects of American economic history. Both of these alternative history arguments have been severely criticized in the past decades. The accuracy of their data has been questioned, their understanding of economic models has been questioned as well, but more than anything, their use of alternative history worlds, fictional, essentially fictional worlds, makes many historians very skeptical and uncomfortable. Historians like to think of themselves as objective and evidence-based, and they argue that there's no evidence for what might have been. There's only evidence for what has been. But what historians like myself would argue is that historians always use alternative history arguments to shape their narratives of the past. Because whenever we say something, an event, a person, an object is historically significant, we are also necessarily saying that the world would have been different if those people, events, or objects didn't exist. So in a sense, every historical argument is partly an alternative history argument. We might not be constructing science fiction universes where technologically advanced Nazis are taking over the world, but we are always constantly using our imaginations to envision why things happen and why things happen the way they did and why things could have happened in different ways. So there you have it. Wolfenstein II The New Colossus may be a work of science fiction, but its use of alternative history connects to methodological debates that historians have been having for the past eight decades. And I argue that historians could learn something from Wolfenstein about how to be more imaginative in the way that we examine why things happen in history and why things could have happened differently. What do you think? Do you buy my argument that the use of alternative history in the video game Wolfenstein connects to the use of alternative history in actual academic historical research? More importantly, do you think alternative histories can be useful in examining our own past, or do you think they should be kept separate as works of fiction or works of literary imagination? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And like I said earlier, I want this series as a whole to become a collaboration between me and uh, watchers. So please, if you have any thoughts on future videos, if you have any interest in historical themes, debates, or specific video games, let me know in the comments below, and I'll get to them as soon as I can. I hope you enjoyed this dive into historical methodology, and I'll see you in the next video. Farewell!